Thank you all for joining us for our six Howard Mathematica lunchtime talk with Dr. De Los Santos from MITRE. During these chats while you chew, you'll meet interesting people or organizations that are doing cool and complimentary work to what you're currently learning about in the Summer Institute at Howard. If you don't have your lunch yet, hit pause. For those of you with food and beverage in hand, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for having us. Um, I'm Hannah De Los Santos from MITRE, um, and we will be presenting on social justice pro projects at the MITRE Corporation. And so just to start with a little bit about MITRE. Um, so MITRE was established in 1958 as a not-for-profit organization, and MITRE works in the public interest across federal, state, and local governments, as well as industry and academia. Um, and our mission is to solve problems for a safer world. Um, so to do that, we operate federally funded research and development centers uh, to analyze and solve complex socio-technical problems. Um, and we provide world-class systems and engineering expertise, objective insight, innovation, and whole of nation vantage points with no commercial conflicts of interest in order to help the government. Um, and MITRE's mission-driven teams are dedicated to solving problems for a safer world. Um, so through our public-private partnerships and federally funded R&D centers, we work across government and in partnership with industry to tackle challenges to the safety, stability, and well-being of our nation. And so one of these things is our social justice platform. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about it. So our mission is to help project teams, our sponsors, and our clients build a fair and just future for all. Um, so that includes identifying and addressing biases and inequity in processes, programs, and communities, um, applying new mindsets and approaches to goal setting, data gathering, and solution development to deliver equitable solutions. Um, and to do that, we want to have our tools and capabilities and subject matter expertise adapted um, and demonstrated impact on decisions um, at either MITRE or our sponsor or externally in other places. Um, in the long term, we really want to reduce uh, uh, disproportionality and disparities in outcome measures. Um, so those outcomes include things like life expectancy, representation and leadership, economic mobility, sense of belonging, and access to resources and opportunities. And so as part of the social justice platform, we deploy solutions across a lot of fields to address change. And so these include government uh, with our equity assessment framework, which proposes an approach and methods for federal agencies to examine programs and policies from the perspective of underserved communities. We also have health uh, with the Mental Wellness Index, which seeks to measure mental wellness for every zip code in the U.S. for both the overall and Black populations using a social justice lens. We are also making changes in the fields of workforce strategy with the Federal Inclusivity Index Tool, or FIT, um, which provides a comparative heat map ranking of all agencies using federal employee viewpoint survey data to address challenges in diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. We also use design thinking with the innovation toolkits to help project teams better understand a user's behaviors, pain points, assumptions, and needs through an equity lens. And we also affect economics with the study of the racial wealth gap in Washington, D.C. in order to support the design of racially equitable legislation using a data-driven systems approach. And so all of these resources and more can be found on our website at sjp.mitre.org or feel free to contact us at socialjusticeplatform at mitre.org. And so now I'll go into depth into one of the social justice projects we have here at MITRE through our research and development program. Um, so as part of the project case study for using a health equity framework in population health, we explored the relationship between redlining and mental health. Um, and this was work done primarily by my colleagues, Elizabeth Murphy, Juliana Bernardi, AJ Liberatore, Karen Jiang, and Car Carla Beasold. So I will start with the most obvious question, uh, what is redlining? So in the Great Depression, as the housing market began failing, President Roosevelt created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC. So HOLC sought to bolster the housing market by classifying areas and cities across the US for mortgage security. 
Um, and they classified areas based on a four level scale. So A at the top, which was colored in green as the most desirable, down to D at the bottom determined as hazardous, colored in red, hence the term redlining. However, these grades were not only based on the conditions of the houses in that area, but also the people who lived there, discriminating against minority communities by giving the areas they lived in lower grades. Um, and this becomes clear in the differences in the clarifying remarks for the graded areas. So for example, in Miami, Florida, we can see that in the A7 area, it was described as being highly restricted ocean pr property, whereas in the D3 area, a 1 million dollar low cost housing uh, Negro project was being built, which counted against it. So in total, 202 cities have graded maps across the US in 38 different states and comprise over 8,000 neighborhoods. Uh, further, new work in population health has shown that red line areas are associated with many adverse health outcomes, including self-reported health, severe asthma, preterm birth, and cancer stage diagnosis. And that really underscores redlining's widespread impact on population health. So to offer a brief background on why we are focusing on mental health equity, um, so according to 2019 SAMHSA data, over 20% of U.S. adults reported experiencing a mental illness in the past year. And we know from past data that racial and ethnic minority populations are less likely to receive mental health treatment than non-Hispanic white populations. And moreover, the pandemic has underscored the persistent systemic inequities which contribute to stress and greater risk of associated mental health conditions. Specifically, depression and anxiety are particularly impacted by social determinants of health. And while there is a lack of robust, robust scientific research explicitly analyzing the association between redlining and mental health outcomes, we focused our literature review on these social determinants of mental health and other factors that may impact mental health outcomes at the community level. And risk and protective factors related to mental health are well understood at the individual or family level, but research applying these factors to a broader community level is relatively recent. So as we know, historic redlining policies contributed to social and economic exclusion in many redlined areas, many of which exhibit persistent social inequities to this day. Um, and these inequities in turn are often associated with higher risk of poor mental health outcomes. And based on our literature review, commonly cited social determinants of mental health and other factors that may impact mental health are represented here. So for example, quality, access to quality education, adequate employment and job security, income equality and neighborhood deprivation or non-deprivation, housing quality and stability, features of the built environment, health outcomes and access to health care, access to sufficient healthy food, social inclusion and social capital or discrimination, exposure to violence, mass incarceration, adverse early life experiences. So we assessed all these possible variables for inclusion, um, as I'll describe in the next slide, and ultimately selected those that were best fit for our model. Um, and likewise, for our outcome variable, we considered numerous sources of national survey data to capture differences in mental health treatment access, utilization, and expenditure, but ultimately selected the R places measure, which is mental health not good for 14 or more days among adults aged 18 years and over. And so in order to span uh, the census tract level and be comprehensive, we process and merge five different data sets at different levels using the most recent data available. So we combined data from the decennial census, which contains census tract geographies, the American Community Survey or ACS, which contains socioeconomic features, the Dalhousie University's particulate matter data sets using the ACAG PM package on GitHub, um, and we also combined uh, places data, which uh, contains BRFSS health measures extrapolated to small areas. Um, and at the city level, we combined all data available at the county level with historical redlining data from mapping inequality, which digitized the redlining maps from 1935 to 1940. And that all goes into the census tracts in the 202 cities that we looked at. So for this preliminary exploratory analysis, as we mentioned, we 
conducted a literature review to examine those overall trends and underlying assumptions. We wanted to identify the most relevant mental health outcomes, as well as the list of potential covariates for our model. And after developing a comprehensive list of mental health outcomes and covariates, we researched available national data sets that would offer the necessary level of granularity for our purposes for our model and narrowed the list of covariates for inclusion based on data availability. So taking that list, we then identified the most significant covariates for inclusion in our preliminary model by running univariate linear regression models on all 202 cities and 19 covariates. Uh, we filtered for a sample size of greater than 50 graded tracks, um, identified models that showed significant associations. We ordered by p-values, r-squared, and AIC values, and identified the most common covariates in each category, which gave us seven covariates, which you can see on the right-hand side, including residential segregation, a percent ratio of income to poverty level below two, uh, unemployment rate 16 and over, percent less than high school, percent non-white, housing stress, and particulate matter. Finally, in order to generate a list of focus cities that we wanted to focus on for a significant association, we ranked our associations by p-value and selected cities with large sample sizes and relatively high coefficient estimates. And we'll be conducting some high level comparative research and analysis for the city and identify some of the local level contextual factors at play. So we applied a simple univariate linear regression model for cities with greater than 50 tracks for whole grade. Uh, that ended up with 66 out of 202 cities. Um, there were significant associations between whole grade and poor mental health in 63 of our 66 cities. Uh, controlling for the six covariates in our multivariate model attenuated that association. Um, so a lot of that variation was likely explained by other factors. Um, but we found that the whole grade was statistically significant um, but positive in 24 of the remaining 63 cities. So overall, there were no generalizable trends apparent across those city models. Um, so when we compare distribution across in individual cities, covariates have varying levels of significance. Um, and that really indicates that you need to look at individual cities to better understand the relationship between whole grade and mental health. Uh, broadly, comparing uh, whole grade A and B tracks to whole grade C and D tracks, those red line tracks, uh, we appear to have higher average housing stress, percent below the 200% federal poverty level, percent completing less than high school, percent non-white, and unemployment rate than A and B tracks, um, and lower overall residential segregation, um, non-white by income, for C and D graded tracks and A and B graded tracks. So to understand why historical redlining had persistent effects in certain cities, uh, we chose to investigate one of our focus cities, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, as a case example. So we selected Baltimore because of that statistically significant association between redlining and mental health prevalence after adjusting for those covariates listed above, and also the availability of literature on housing and other place-based discrimination and inclusion in the city. So when we ran the multivariate model for Baltimore, about 84% of the litter variance in poor mental health is explained by our model. So here in our model, as whole grade increases by one grade, grade poor mental health prevalence increases by 0.56%, um, controlling for the aforementioned covariates. And D and C graded tracks outnumber A and B graded tracks in Baltimore, as you can see in the figure on the right. Um, and here the degraded tracks have the greatest variability um, based on interquartile range. Um, and the map here applies historic whole grades to a current day map of Baltimore, including parts of Baltimore County, and overlays it with dots to do poor mental health prevalence by census tract. And so here we can see that formerly redlined downtown and waterfront tracks with lower prevalence of poor mental health coincide with gentrified areas based on the National Community Reinvestment Coalition mapping. Um, and these large distributions and variability for degraded tracks may be indicative of patterns of neighborhood change. So to dig further into the variation in redlining across these tracks, we chose to stratify our model with 
above and below the median of percent non-white residents. Um, and this reveals the increased magnitude between redlining and mental health for tracks with an above meaning percentage of non-white residents in Baltimore with nearly double the magnitude of prevalence for every single grade increase in poor mental health. We also wanted to look at the distribution of covariates for those tracks with below um, and above the median percent of non-white in the city. Um, and red indicates below the median percentage, while blue indicates above the median percentage of non-white residents in those distribution box plots at the bottom. And we can see that tracks with above the median percentage of non-white residents have higher housing stress, higher amounts of those below the federal poverty level, higher amounts of those with only a high school degree, higher poor mental health prevalence, and a higher unemployment rate. So that was a lot, um, but we have some key takeaways. So we found that there is an association between whole grade and mental health, and that there are persistent significant relationships in certain large cities. So many cities, including Baltimore, had a positive significant association, and much of the variation is likely explained by other factors. There is no one size fits all model. So you need to account for local factors, use local data to complement any national model. Um, and as a reminder, the development of Hulk maps and application of Hulk grades were also a localized process implemented by local surveyors and submitted to the federal government. So it stands to reason that we would need to look at that more local level. In Baltimore, Maryland, uh, based on an analysis and scan of the articles related to Baltimore, the association is likely impacted by gentrification, blockbusting, and neighborhood investment levels. And we will describe this in more detail in our working paper. And future investigation on the relationship between redlining and mental health in Baltimore and other whole graded cities would benefit from accounting for patterns of neighborhood change, such as gentrification and blockbusting, um, and a more detailed examination of public and private neighborhood investment levels, including lending disparities. And based on our exploratory analysis, we can see that historic factors like the redlining policies of 19, 1930s and 1940s can continue to affect health outcomes, including mental health to this day. And so it's important that place-based interventions related to mental health consider the historic policies, including redlining. A more nuanced understanding of how historic discriminatory policies continue to shape current health inequities may help to guide more evidence-based investments and decisions related to health and social policies and programs. Um, finally, as I alluded to, we've developed a white paper to capture this exploratory analysis and we'll be releasing this work in conjunction with the Social Justice Platform in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. I know our participants are looking forward to live Q&A with you during the Institute in June. Thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.